We'll move to questions without notice. Oh, sorry, Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a statement regarding a ministerial absence. Leave is granted. Uh, I advise the Senate that Senator Reynolds will be absent from question time today due to illness. Uh, in Senator Reynolds' absence, Senator Payne will represent the Minister for Defence Industry, the Minister for Defence, the Minister for Veterans Affairs, the Minister for Defence Personnel, the Minister assisting the Prime Minister for the Centenary of Anzac, and the Minister for Emergency Management and North Queensland Recovery. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Fifield. In last night's budget, the Treasurer delivered a once-off energy payment which left out thousands of Australians who rely on AB study, Oz study, double orphan pension, New Start allowance, parenting payment, partnered parent allowance, sickness allowance, special benefit widow allowance, wife pension, youth allowance and veteran payment. On what basis did the government think those supporting these government payments were not deserving of support? The Minister representing the Minister for Social Services and Families, Senator Fifield. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. President. Uh, the uh, government is uh, aware of the financial uh, pressures that are placed on households, uh, which do make it harder for many Australians to pay their bills, especially those receiving uh, income support payments. Uh, the government has uh, taken the decision uh, that around 5 million income support recipients will receive uh, this energy payment, uh, including uh, those on the age pension, the disability support pension, as well as other working age benefits, including New Start and Youth Allowance. Uh, we are in a position to offer this support uh, because of uh, strong economic management. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr President, um, this is indeed uh, an example of the fact that uh, pursuing uh, good, strong economic management and a responsible approach to the budget is not uh, an end in and of itself. Uh, it has meaning uh, as far as it provides the opportunity for government uh, to assist members of the community who need it. Uh, and so, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr President, uh, the government uh, absolutely um, uh, puts its hand up and acknowledges uh, that uh, we have taken uh, a conscious decision uh, to make uh, this payment available for those on Newstart as well. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. I don't know if you answered my first question, but um, on radio this morning, less than 24 hours after he delivered his budget, the Treasurer caved in to pressure from Labor and backflipped, saying that Australians on Newstart would now receive an energy payment. Can the minister confirm that this change was agreed in a crisis meeting between the Prime Minister, Treasurer and Finance Minister last night? When was the minister first advised of the change? Before or after the budget speech? Senator Fifield. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Well, uh, the, the Prime Minister, the Treasurer and the Finance Minister don't have crisis meetings. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, they, they conduct uh, the administration of, uh, of government uh, on, a, on an orderly Order. uh, and methodical basis, uh, as you would expect. Uh, but, uh, but, but, Mr President, uh, what we wanted to ensure was that uh, this measure uh, secured swift passage through the parliament order. so that Senator it could— Fyfield, um, Senator Wong, on a point of order. The question is, when was this minister first advised of the change of the, to the budget? Um, when was the minister first advised of the change before or after the budget speech? Um, Senator, Senator Wong, you, you rightly remind the minister of part of the question. I consider him to be directly relevant to the other part of the question at the moment. Senator Fifield, have you concluded your answer or are you continuing? Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to continue, uh, Mr uh, President. Um, as, I, as I was saying, um, we wanted to ensure that this important measure uh, had swift passage through uh, both chambers. Uh, we did not want to uh, allow those opposite uh, a reason, a rationale, to delay or prevent the passage of this measure. Uh, so, through the decision the government has taken, uh, there will be more support, uh, and I'm confident uh, that this chamber will support the passage of this legislation. Order, Senator. Order. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. Can the minister confirm the government's backflip less than 24 hours after delivering the budget has blown an $80 million hole in it, 
And isn't it clear that with the budget unravelling, this is a government in crisis, continuing a sixth year of chaos and division? Senator Fifield. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, what I can absolutely confirm uh, is that uh, what this government has done is uh, deliver a budget that will see a surplus uh, for the first time since. Well, we'd have to go back to when Mr. Costello was the treasurer of this country. Hey, Mr. Mr. President, there used to be there used to be a rule. I'll call it the Costello rule where the former Treasurer said that for each year of bad Labor government, you would actually need three years of good coalition government to undo the damage. Well, what order, this government has Senator demonstrated Fyfield, is order, we can— Senator Fyfield, order. I will call Senator McAllister on a point of order when there's silence. Senator McAllister. My point of order is relevant. I ask for a confirmation of the cost of this backflip, and that's yet to be provided. Um, you reminded the minister of part of the question. I'm listening carefully. He has 23 seconds remaining to answer. Senator Fifield. Uh, th thank you, Mr. President. So, as I was saying, um, this government has demonstrated that within six years uh, you can actually repair six years of damage done by Labor. We have got the budget back in balance. Obviously, there's still the work to do to pay down the debt of those opposite, and we will. Order. Order. Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. How does the Liberal National Government's plan for a stronger economy, as set out in the 2019-20 budget, provide the opportunity for hard-working Australians to get ahead? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I think it's time to remind the Chamber again that when we came into government in September 2013, uh, the economy was weakening, unemployment was rising and the budget position was rapidly uh, deteriorating. Today, the economy is stronger, employment growth is much stronger, the unemployment rate has got a four in front of it, and of course, we've got the budget back in a strong uh, and improving position. In fact, we've got the budget back in the black. Now, what a stronger economy delivers is better opportunities for families to get ahead. Of course, the opportunity to get a job and get a better job. Of course, uh, it, also means, it also means as more people are employed, uh, that government collects more personal income tax revenue without the need to increase taxes. More people paying tax means more revenue for government without the need to increase taxes. And you know what the government can do in that circumstance? We can cut taxes. We can provide income tax relief to encourage and reward and incentivise hard-working families across Australia, as well as funding all of the essential services across health, education, uh, you name it, that Australians rely on. Because, of course, when Labor was last in government, they had made such a mess of the budget that made such a mess of the budget in the context of a weakening economy, rising unemployment and a rapidly deteriorating budget position. You know what, you know what happened under Labor? You know what happened under Labor? They stopped listing essential medicines on the pharmaceutical benefit scheme. Order. On the pharmaceutical benefit scheme. Now this government, this government under our period in government, on the back of a stronger economy, on the back, on the back of uh, expenditure con more effective expenditure control, on the back of managing the budget better, we are actually able to invest in providing affordable access to high quali quality medicines for all patients across Australia. 2,000 medicines listed uh, during our period in government at a cost of about $10 billion. These are the sorts of things that a good government can do that manages the economy properly, that manages the budget properly. Uh, this is, of course, not the time to change direction and go back to the discredited labour way of the past. Coleman. Senator Hume, yeah. a supplementary question. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. How does the Liberal National Government's plan for a stronger economy guarantee the essential services that Australians want and expect. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, President. And as I was just indicating, our economic plan has made it possible to deliver the more and better services Australians deserve. More medicines on the PBS, more access to quality health care, secure defences, less congested roads, a new inland rail network for Eastern Australia, and a new Western Sydney airport breaking a deadlock that had eluded successive governments for decades. But we're not complacent about the need to continue to build a stronger economy, which is why, of course, we have a plan 
for stronger growth, another one and a quarter million new jobs over the next five years, a plan that will drive stronger wages growth across the economy, and it's a plan that is based on rewarding aspiration, rewarding enterprise and effort. And that is why, of course, in last night's budget, the government also announced more tax relief for small and medium-sized businesses. We want small businesses to prosper. We want them to employ even more Australians and pay them better wages. That is why we need to ensure they can be as successful as they Order. possibly can Senator be. Senator Cormann. Senator Hume, a final supplementary question? Yes, thank you, Mr President. How will Australians be safer and more secure under a Liberal National Government's plan for a stronger economy, and are there any alternate approaches? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, the impact of alternate uh, economic approaches is entirely predictable. Um, there is no question that if uh, Mr Shorten was successful at the next election, it would make our economy weaker, it would make our country weaker, it would make Australians poorer. Uh, a shortened Labor government would take us backward. Higher unemployment, weaker growth, lower living standards and a budget mess. Uh, Mr Shorten, of course, sneers at those who want to get ahead and only promises them a higher tax burden. I mean, he's already said, he's already said people, uh, aspirational middle-class Australians, do not deserve tax breaks. That is what Mr Shorten, that is what Mr. Shorten says. If you buy an investment property to, to secure your family's economic future, the Labor Party will uh, have their hand in your pocket. If you buy some shares for your retirement, the Labor Party will have their hand in your pocket. If you try to build a nest act to pass on to your kids, the Labor Party will have their hand in your pocket. I mean, it is, the Labor Party does not know how to manage money. When they run out of money, they come after yours. That is the message to the Order, Australian people. Senator Cormann. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Fifield. In 2018-19 financial year, the Coalition Government oversaw a $3.4 billion underspend in the NDIS. In la last night's budget, it was revealed that in the 2019-2020 financial year, the Morrison Government is banking a $1.6 billion underspend in the NDIS. Can the minister confirm that this means 77,000 people will miss out on the NDIS this year alone? The minister representing the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Fifield. Th thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, and can I say, as a former Minister for Disabilities, how disappointed I am that those opposite, who know full well how the NDIS operates, are seeking to create a problem that does not exist. The NDIS is operating under this government exactly as it would operate under those opposite. Uh, Mr President, uh, Order. the NDIS is fully funded under this government and will continue to be fully funded under this government. Uh, funding for the NDIS is like many programs within government, Mr. President, it is a demand-driven program. NDIS estimates are updated up or down at every budget, as they would be under those opposite. Uh, the NDIS uh, estimates are updated up or down at every MAIFO, as they would be under those opposite. NDIS estimates are updated up or down at every final budget outcome, as they would be under those opposite. Mr President, the NDIS is a program which is in transition. Uh, we are transferring from a state-based system to a national system. People are progressively moving from their state-based arrangements to the NDIS. There are now, I would hope all colleagues would be pleased to acknowledge, more than 250,000 Australians who have a disability who are benefiting from the NDIS and 78,000 of those are people who are receiving supports for the very first time. Everyone, everyone who is eligible for the NDIS, who has transitioned to the NDIS, will get the support that they are entitled to. They will get the support that they deserve. Uh, for those opposite to portray the usual process of estimates uh, being adjusted uh, as something uh, strange and unusual is quite, quite wrong. Senator Brown, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. In response to the re revelations, Kirsten Dean of everyone, Every Australian Counts has said that, and I quote, it is completely unacceptable to leave people with disability waiting two years for a wheelchair while you bolster the budget bottom line. End quote. Is Ms. Dean wrong? Senator Fifield. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I know Ms. Dean uh, very well, uh, and she has done an outstanding job uh, advocating for Australians with disability. Uh, and I think uh, many colleagues in this place uh, have uh, worked uh, with uh, Kirsten Dean. Uh, but, uh, Mr. President, it is completely and utterly wrong for those opposite to contend and to purport uh, that there has been funding cut from the NDIS. That is not true. Uh, all funding that is available, um, all funding that is needed uh, by uh, NDIS participants will be forthcoming. There will not be uh, anyone who requires support uh, under the NDIS who does not receive that support. Every eligible person for the NDIS uh, will receive the support to which they are entitled. Those opposite should know better than to seek to cause fear and distress amongst people with disabilities by misrepresenting, by misrepresenting Order, the way Senator that the works. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Brown, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. What does it say about the priorities of the Morrison government that it's willing to use a $1.6 billion underspend in the NDIS to prop up its budget's bottom line? Senator Fifield. Mm. Uh, well, everything that Senator Brown just said is wrong. Uh, Mr President, um, I had hoped that if there was one area of policy where bipartisanship could be maintained as we head into a, an election, that it would be the NDIS. I would have hoped that those opposite, rather than seeking to cause fear where there is no reason for fear, would actually be part of helping to explain the way that the budget processes operate and helping to explain to Australians with disability, their families and carers that there's nothing to worry about, that the NDIS is fully funded, that everyone who is entitled to an NDIS package will receive their full package without any deviation. Uh, Mr President, it is extremely disappointing that those opposite can't raise their sights, can't raise their sights on this issue. Senator Di Natale. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Leader of the Government representing the Prime Minister. Minister, the people of Australia are ready for strong action to stop our climate breakdown. They are desperate for some leadership and vision. Minister, how on earth do you explain why your government has spent more on opening and closing Christmas Island over the last four weeks than you will spend on climate change over the next four years? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Uh, you know, this government is absolutely committed to uh, strong, effective and appropriate action on climate change, uh, including uh, through our $3.5 billion climate uh, change uh, package. And of course, and of course uh, you know, what, what, you, uh, what I'm sure you would uh, remember is that when we came into government in 2013, you know what the situation was in terms of meeting the Kyoto Protocol targets? Uh, by 2020, we were 755 million tonnes of CO2 behind. 755 million tonnes of CO2 behind. And that was after a six year period of a LIBOR Green government. Now, I know, of course, that the uh, Green uh, part of that uh, government uh, was uh, not so supportive of LIBOR's carbon pollution reduction scheme. And, and you know, I can understand that. I had a lot of sympathy for that at the time. But you know, what, you know where we're at now? After six years of Liberal National Coalition government, we are now running 367 million tonnes of CO2 ahead of our 2020 emissions reduction target. And we have a clear plan uh, to meet the 2030 emissions reduction target that we've signed on to uh, in Paris, the 26% emissions reduction target. But you know what? The Liberal National Party will always uh, pursue environment, sensible environmental uh, yeah. policy in a way that is economically responsible. Uh, you can go uh, to your supporters and uh, you know, continue to try and make them believe that you can shut down the economy, that you can shut down the economy and that that is a sensible way to go. That is not the way we're doing it. We are, we are telling the Australian people very, very openly and very transparently that we want to do the right thing by the environment, meeting our emissions reduction targets that we've committed to, but in a way that is economically responsible because we want families around Australia to continue to have the best possible opportunity to get ahead. Senator Di Natale, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, we're facing a climate emergency, and yet over the next four years you're committing $189 million for your so-called climate solutions package, 
yet you're spending 174 times more than that, a staggering $33 billion to pay massive mining companies to burn fossil fuels. How on earth do you justify that to the Australian people? Senator Cormann. Well, uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. The, pro the problem with socialists is that they don't understand the difference between spending money and raising less in revenue out of the economy. Now, and I wasn't reflecting on the Labor Party. I, know, I, I heard that Senator uh, Wong uh, might have been getting a bit sensitive there. When I say socialists, I mean those green socialists at the bottom of the uh, Senate chamber over there, at the corner of the Senate chamber over there. Now, now let, let, me, let me just make it very clear. Uh, when the when the government raises less in tax out of the economy, that is leaving business and Australians with more of their own money. With more of their own money. Now, and you're obviously talking about the fact that in relation to road user charges, uh, that businesses that don't actually use roads are not required to pay road user charges, which is of course an entirely reasonable thing to do. I mean, if you use roads, you pay road user charges. If you don't use roads, you don't. That is sort of what we believe in on this side of the chamber, and of course we do believe in stronger economic growth. Order, Senator more Cormann, jobs, time for the answer has expired. The Senator Cormann. Order. Order. Senator Di Natale, a final supplementary question. Uh, Minister, since 2012, uh, the coalition's received $4.7 million from the coal, oil and gas industry. Uh, given last night's budget sellout on climate, can you fill us in on a figure that wasn't in the budget papers? How much money do you expect to get in donations from the coal, oil and gas industry to fund your election campaign and to continue selling out Australians when it comes to action on climate change? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I completely and utterly reject the premise of the question. Order. Order. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Small and Family Business, Skills and Vocational Education, Senator Cash, who recently visited a number of small businesses in Launceston with my, our Liberal candidate in Bass, um, Bridget Archer and myself. How will the Liberal National Government's budget benefit our nation's 3.3 million small and family businesses and their 5.7 million employees? The Minister for Small and Family Business, Skills and Vocational Education, Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Askew for the question, and I acknowledge that it is her first question, and congratulate her on that. Colleagues, as we know, last night's budget, the Treasurer yet again overwhelmingly affirmed the Coalition's commitment to small and family businesses in Australia. Why? Because we know that small and family businesses are the engine room of the Australian economy. When small and family businesses in Australia grow, Mr President, they create more jobs for Australians. Last night was a vote of confidence in small and family businesses across Australia. In particular, as you are aware, we increased the instant asset write-off from $25,000 to $30,000 and we extended it out to the 30th of June 2020. But colleagues, because of the strong economy that we have put in place, we were also able to uh, increase the threshold, Mr President, from businesses with an annual turnover of $10 million or less to medium-sized businesses. We've expanded it to medium-sized businesses with an annual turnover of $50 million or less. Mr President, that is what you get when you put in place a strong economy. You can give back in particular to small and medium businesses in Australia. And Mr President, on that policy alone, it will benefit around 3.4 million businesses, employing around 7.7 .7 million workers. And, Mr. President, of course, this comes on top of our tax cuts for small uh, businesses, which we are able to fast track again because of the policies that we have put in place that have given us a strong economy. These tax cuts, Mr President, will see small businesses in Australia, small and medium businesses, paying 25 per cent by 21-22. Again, you back small and medium business, you create jobs Order. for Australians. Senator Cash, Senator ask you a supplementary question. Minister, why is supporting small business so important to ensuring continued economic growth and returning the budget to surplus? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as we all know, 
When small and family businesses in Australia prosper and grow, they create more jobs for Australians. When we were elected to office in 2013, we said to the Australian people, we will put in place the economic framework so that businesses in Australia can create jobs. And Mr President, that is exactly what we did. We said we'd create a million jobs within five years, and we did that ahead of time. Under the coalition government, the Liberal National Government, the economy has created almost 1.3 million jobs. And Mr President, we have now been able to make the promise that if we are re-elected, we intend on ensuring we put in place the right policies so that businesses out there can prosper and grow and create a further 1.25 million jobs. Mr President, last night's budget was the next stage of the Morrison government's economic plan, which we intend to deliver for the betterment of Order, Australians. Senator Cash. Senator Askew, a final supplementary question. Minister, what are you doing to ensure that Australian small businesses are getting the skilled workers that they need to continue to prosper and grow? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, again, a big feature of last night's budget was a more than half a billion dollar investment in skills for today and for tomorrow, because we understand that businesses need employees with the right skills. And one of the big announcements in last night's budget was that we will invest in 80,000 apprentices. That's right, colleagues, 80,000 apprentices across Australia in areas of skills need, because we want to put in place the right policies, look at where the skills are required and ensure that businesses, but in particular, Mr President, small and family businesses, have access to the skills requirements that they need. And, Mr President, as part of our investment in excess of half a billion dollars, we're also going to ensure that those who are recently unemployed do have access to the foundation schools that they need to ensure that they are able to fully participate in the workplace. Order, Senator Cash. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr President. My question is for the minister representing the Minister for Defence Industries, Senator Payne, and relates to local content in the Future Submarine Program. Estimates questions on notice have revealed the following. A total of $1.9 billion in contracts has been awarded for the Future Submarine Project. Naval Group has been awarded two substantive contracts, uh, totalling just over a billion dollars, for design work to be predominantly carried out in France. Australian entities have been awarded uh, $834 million in contracts, but Defence has advised that only 67 per cent of that money uh, is being spent on uh, local content. So we've got $1.9 billion worth of contracts that have been awarded by the Future Submarine Project, but only $569 million has been spent on local content. That's about 30 per cent. What explanation does the government have for dropping this figure from originally 90 per cent, announced by uh, Minister Pine, to 60 per cent and now to a mere uh, 30 per cent for local content? The Minister representing the Minister for Defence Industry, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank uh, Senator Patrick for his question and some advice uh, of the question. Um, Mr President, uh, as Senator Patrick uh, is well aware, uh, in fact, perhaps better aware than most uh, in the chamber, given his own professional experience, one would hope. Uh, this is a very long-term project. You know that. This is a project which this government took on after those opposite completely abrogated their responsibility to ensure that Australia had the submarine capability it required to do the jobs that we ask the ADF to do. Our commitment to Australian industry engagement and industry content in the attack class program is absolutely steadfast. Senator Patrick used uh, a couple of statistics, a couple of figures rather, in his, uh, in his question. He uh, referred to a 90 per cent figure, which, as I recall, was actually used by a then DCNS official uh, and not initiated by Minister Pine. The involvement of Australian industry in the attack class submarine program is critically important to its construction, its sovereign construction, its operation and the sustainment of the attack class submarine fleet. That has been the premise from which we have operated from the very beginning of this process. I've told this chamber on a number of occasions in various incarnations of my responsibility that we will not put a 
ceiling on local content because we want to absolutely maximise it. We've made a variety of major announcements on how we're securing work in Australia, including the signing of the strategic partnering agreement, the signing of the design contract, the, the, the signing of a framework agreement between Naval Group Australia and ASC, identifying ways to collaborate with each other to support Australia's sovereign submarine capability, the establishment of the Naval Shipbuilding College in South Australia to ensure we've got the workers we need yeah. to get jobs done, the transition Order. of 270 Payne, jobs from the France to has Australia. Expired. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Now, the department has given guidance as to why the number is so low at this stage, suggesting we don't have the know why or the know how at this early stage. However, we've got plenty of know how and know why, and that's in ASC in Adelaide. Unfortunately, we know that DCNS offered to partner with ASC in this build, in this program, that uh, has been conceded by Defence. Will you, do you accept that uh, when, when you carve them out, you've made a billion dollar, uh, multi billion dollar mistake in terms Order, of local Senator content? Patrick. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I absolutely do not accept the premise of uh, Senator Patrick's question. I was just about to say that we're in my previous answer, we're transitioning 270 submarine design jobs from France to Australia. We've announced that Lang O'Rourke is the managing contractor to construct a purpose-built submarine yard at Osborne North, creating hundreds of construction jobs. We've announced that Lockheed Martin will design. Lockheed Martin Australia will design and integrate the $700 million combat system for the attack class, creating around 200 Australian jobs. We are still in the very early phases of this, Mr. President, and uh, to the Senate chamber. But in terms of activities which are going to be located here, just for starters, we have detailed design, we have product engineering, we have design authority for sustainment, we have land-based integration and testing, sea-based integration and testing, construction of the submarine uh, construction yard, which I've referred to, construction of the 12 boats themselves, construction of the support infrastructure, ranges, wharves and training, development of a sovereign supply chain to support the fleet, including ongoing sustainment of the fleet, such as upkeep, uh, updates and upgrades. We are absolutely Order, committed Payne. to maximising Australian industry and content. Senator Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Minister, um, in, in 2016, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Costello did say 90 per cent, but Minister Pine repeated that to the uh, South Australian electorate. Uh, we've moved from 90 per cent. He then said 60 per cent in a radio uh, interview in, in Adelaide. You have conceded you haven't put any maximums. Uh, we're only at 30 per cent. Minister, how low are you going to let this go? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. It strikes me as passing strange, Mr. President, that as far as I can tell, the only people in Australia who are talking down the development of the attack class submarine are senators from South Australia, like Senator Patrick, and occasionally those opposite, when they feel a twinge of guilt about what they completely failed to do for the entire term of their government. Our job, our task, and our commitment is to maximise Australian content, to maximise Australian industry engagement. It is what I have prosecuted, it's what Minister Pine has prosecuted, and it's what my colleague Senator Lynna Reynolds will continue to do as the Defence Industry Minister. Senator Williams. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Regional Services, Senator Mackenzie. How is the Liberal National Government's strong economic management benefiting those Australians living in regional areas? Minister for Regional Services, Senator Mackenzie. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Williams for his questions. He knows that when the regions are strong, so too is Australia, and he's championed this his entire senatorial career. Regional Australia produces over 30 per cent of our GDP and 70 per cent of our export, drives the wealth production across our nation. And the Liberal National Government's focus on returning the budget to surplus for the first time in more than a decade means that we can invest further in the areas that Australians care about. Additional tax relief to support hard-working regional Australians, the public school teachers, the nurses, the tradies in our communities, with more than $1,000 of their hard-earned dollars back in their pockets because of our changes. This will help that no matter where we live, you, we are investing to help people get home to their families safer and sooner, connecting our regions as part of our record $100 billion investment in our nation's infrastructure. This will help manage our growing population, improve freight and transport routes for our fa fabulous 
uh, fresh produce, connect communities and reduce traffic accidents and fatalities. Returning the budget to surplus is not an abstract concept. It produces real benefits and outcomes for people right across the country. No longer an abstract con construct in this country will be fast rail. Uh, we have put $2 billion on the table to connect Melbourne to Geelong. We've also invested in developing eight business cases to connect East Coast regional capitals uh, with the regions. The budget surplus also allows us to invest in building better regions fund to improve and support growth and local jobs in our regional community. It also means we're able to invest in our young people, so critical to our prosperity, to support them with vocational training, apprenticeships and, in times of difficulty, uh, mental health sport and suicide prevention programs. This is what real fiscal— Order, Senator McKenzie. Time for the answers expired. Senator Williams, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. I thank the minister and ask, how will Regional Australia benefit from the record investments in infrastructure announced in Budget 2019? Senator McKenzie. There are 100 billion reasons why Regional Australia should be excited about our investment in key of... infrastructure. There's the additional $1 billion we're adding to the roads of strategic importance to take our total investment to over $4.5 billion to provide long-lasting benefits long after the construction finishes. Through this initiative, we're investing in over 25 key freight corridors, including feeder roads, to more efficiently connect agriculture and mining regions to our ports, our airports and other transport hubs. There's more than $2 billion to improve road safety and dedicated programs to improve roads right across rural and regional Australia. As local government minister, I know the vital role that local councils play in identifying and improving local roads. And because of this sound fiscal management, we're able to provide $1.1 billion to local councils right across Australia to improve their local roads through our iconic Roads to Recovery program. Senator Williams, a final supplementary question. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Now, my last question is placed in a real curly one to the minister. <laughs> what would be the consequence for Regional Australia of alternative approaches that fail to prioritise crucial infrastructure? <laughs> Senator McKenzie. <laughs> well, thank you. That is uh, not such a curly one after all, because uh, I think the greatest risk to the prosperity of our nation and through uh, hampering the productive capacity of the regions, of the agriculture sector, of the mining sector, is those people opposite yeah, yeah. because of the dirty deal that they will do with our economy-wrecking Greens, who actually, actually want to see the end of the mining industry, employing hundreds of thousands of Australians in the regions. And why the CFMEU Forestry Division, Order. Mining Division, is not saying to you what is your preference deal and why are you actually going to stand with these people who are going to put your own members out of work. There is one reason, one reason, if you're a regional Australian, to back a Liberal National Coalition and the budget is because we will look after your families, we'll look after your jobs Order. and provide a Senator safe, McKenzie. prosperous Time future. For the answer has expired. Order. Order. Order, Senator Wong. It's the last question time for quite a while. Everyone take a deep breath. That's what you keep telling me, Senator Watt. Senator Bernardi. Thank you, Mr. Cre uh, Mr. President. Uh, I must say that this question has been developed from the contribution of thousands of Australians, and it's, the question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Across recent history, the UN has criticised Australia's human rights record under previous and current coalition governments, subjected us to a barrage of criticism over asylum seekers and offshore detention criticised the boat turnback policy. We've been wrapped by the special rapporteur on torture and accused of chronic non-compliance that was off the charts, meaning we had very little to be proud of. Reportedly, the member for Denison wants to refer coalition ministers to the International Criminal Court for Crimes Against Humanity. Why does Australia continue to support an organisation that allows genocides, torture and true crimes of humanity to go unchecked and waste time undermining our border security? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and uh, <clears throat> thanks, Senator Bernardi, for uh, for his question. I think it's very important to remind ourselves of the importance of effective multilateralism, of the importance of 
uh, the contribution that it makes to protecting and promoting the rules-based international order, uh, what it makes to contributing to our own objectives uh, in the Indo-Pacific. So Australia focuses on contributing to an efficient and effective UN. We don't always agree. In fact, we have robust differences of opinion from time to time within the UN and its associated agencies, bodies like the Human Rights Council, of, uh, of which we are a recently elected member. But the contribution to those things, where strong global cooperation sets a tone, where it sets in place rules and norms for constructive diplomacy in every region of the world, is a very important part of Australia's engagement and has been thus since the inception of the United Nations, where Australia was a founding member 70 years ago. So we see a period of rapid and accelerating change. We see times of rising nationalism and geopolitical competition, but that does not mean that we should walk away from those organisations uh, in which we have the opportunity to argue for the rules-based international order, in which we have the opportunity to protect and promote those systems and processes which enable us to solve problems together. Our most urgent global challenges are not going to be solved by any one country acting alone. There are a vast number of them, as Senator Bernardi has alluded to. And as I have said explicitly, both here Order. and elsewhere— Order. Senator Payne, time for the answers expired. Senator Bernardi, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. I thank the minister. According to DFAT annual reports, when the coalition took office, Australia contributed $193 million that year to the UN. Unlike self-funded retirees' slow rates of return on investments, the UN has enjoyed a 46 per cent funding increase over the coalition's six-year lifespan to $282 million. Australia has been ravaged by drought, cyclones and bushfires. So why do we keep increasing aid funding to a body that condemns us? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. And I do think um, it is an invidious comparison to suggest that uh, our relatively um, reasonable contribution to bodies such as this uh, prevents the government from making the contributions that we do in relation to natural disasters and emergencies in our own country. This government has taken significant steps to support those most seriously affected by the worst of natural disasters recently, whether they are, have been floods or fires or cyclones or drought and ongoing drought, which we acknowledge is an extraordinary challenge for those uh, suffering. This government, has not, this government does not accept this is an either-or proposition. We are able, through the management of a strong economy, to play a responsible role in the international community, to contribute to security and stability in so doing, but also to support those Australians in greatest need. Senator Bernardi, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. In this place, I have raised specific questions about the Paris Climate Pact, the diversion of Australian aid money to ghost programs in Afghanistan and to purveyors of terrorism in Palestine. Is the government proud of throwing away rapidly precious, or increasing amounts of precious taxpayer money to United Nations that continue, uh, continually opposes both our border security and our sovereignty? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. When, you, when Senator Bernardi has raised those issues of concern, the government has, of course, and other senators, I may say, has, uh, of course, made appropriate investigations. And I acknowledge that uh, uh, some of those have, uh, have needed to be addressed. Some have come to nothing, Mr President. I am not uh, for a moment claiming that uh, the system in which we operate internationally, the uh, rules-based international order which we uh, work within, uh, will always solve and address every problem. The world would be a very different place if it could. But the contribution that Australia makes as a supporter of the rules-based international order, as a contribution to security and stability in our own region and elsewhere, is a very important one. 
We have been a leader in this context for decades and decades. We raise concerns when we have them. We engage in robust discussions and debates with those Order. who run— Senator Payne, time for the answers expired. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Can the minister confirm that in Mr Morrison's budget last night, millions of working Australians earning less than $40,000 miss out on a bigger tax cut, while bankers and CEOs receive a tax cut of $11,000 a year? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Th thank, thank you very much, Mr President. No, I cannot uh, confirm that. And that's, uh, you, should not, you should not believe something just because the shadow treasurer uh, says so. So, I mean, this government, uh, in our uh, second major income tax relief package for hardworking families, has again prioritised Low and middle income earners has again prioritised low and middle income earners, as well as continuing to address bracket creep, as well as yes. continuing uh, to simplify our tax system with a, with a view of incentivising and rewarding hardworking Australians. And what I what I would say, and this is very important, um, this is very important, um, uh, Mr. President. So the good uh, senator uh, asked me about uh, the uh, tax burden at the lower income end. Well, somebody on thirty thousand dollars on thirty thousand dollars a year gets a ten point six percent tax cut as a result of the income tax relief packages that this government has put forward, a 10.6 per cent tax cut, whereas somebody on 200,000 uh, where, where where, where yep. somebody on 200,000 gets a 0.2 per cent tax cut. A 0.2 per cent tax cut. Well, of course, somebody on $30,000 a year will be paying $2,142 in tax, whereas somebody on $200,000 will pay $67,000 in tax. $2,142 versus $67,000. $1,097. Now, uh, the point is, our tax system is highly progressive. And once our plan has been legislated in full, the top 5% of income earners in Australia will continue to pay a third, a third of the income tax revenue generated in Australia. A third. But of course, Mr. President, I mean, we understand on this side of the chamber that it is entirely appropriate and economically important to incentivise, encourage and reward aspiration. Yeah, yeah. Of course, it is an, a, entirely appropriate and important for the future economic success of all Australians, including and in particular low and middle income earners, to ensure that all Australians have the right incentive. Order. To Senator work. Cormann, time for the answers expired. Senator Ciccone, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister confirm that the majority of people who will miss out on a bigger tax cut are women? Why is Mr Morrison making it harder for working women to make ends meet. Senator Cormann. Th th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, uh, the, the problem, and I, mean, I welcome you to this chamber, and I wish you a very successful career for many years to come, hopefully for uh, quite a bit longer on the opposition benches. But what I, would, what I would advise you very genuinely is when you are handed questions by your tactics committee, perhaps try and, answer to the, uh, try and listen to the answer to the primary question before you just read out the first supplementary that you were handed. Because the premise of the question is entirely wrong. And if you had listened, if you had listened to my answer to the primary question, you would know that the premise of the question is entirely wrong. Because Australians at the lower income end are getting higher tax cuts on, a, on percentage. The percentage the, our, our percentages, our percentages says, our percentages says, our percentages says, Senator, Senator, our percentages. Yes, indeed. Order. So let me repeat it. Let me repeat it. Order. Somebody, <clears throat> somebody on thirty thousand dollars a year gets a ten point six percent tax cut uh, under our government, whereas somebody on two hundred thousand dollars a year gets a zero point two percent tax Time cut. Time for the answer has expired. Order on my left. Order on my left. Now on my right. Senator O'Neill, I've just called order. Your colleague is waiting to get on his feet. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Mr President. With cuts to Medicare, hospitals and schools and bigger tax cuts for bankers and CEOs, doesn't this show that after six years of cuts and chaos, this government is only for the top end of town? Yep. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Well, that, that is just a bit of uh, student political rhetoric that I completely reject. 
I mean, this is, this is a government, this, this Liberal National Government is a government that is focused on the best interests of all Australians. We are focused on making sure that all Australians have the best possible opportunity to get ahead. We want to ensure that all Australians have the best possible opportunity to lift their living standards. And you know what? We understand that the way to do this is through a stronger economy through a stronger economy. And that is, of course, why we continue to pursue uh, our national economic plan, which has been successful in delivering a stronger economy. And let me, I mean, what is the alternative? The alternative, the alternative is the high-taxing, anti-business, class warfare agenda of the Leader of the Opposition, which would make the economy weaker, which would make the country weaker, which would make all Australians poorer. You know what? Socialism has been tried in other places around the world before. And you know what it does? It makes everyone poorer, including and in particular low-income earners. If you want to help lift low-income earners, if you want to give the opportunity for low-income earners Senator to become higher-income earners, the we need a stronger economy. Order. Senator Macdonald. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, uh, my question is to Senator Canavan, representing the Minister for Agriculture and Water Resources, and I ask the Minister how our government's uh, strong economic management and the budget plan is providing for the resources to invest in new market opportunities for our farmers and our agricultural products. The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture and Water Resources, Senator Canavan. Uh, thank, you. <coughs> thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Macdonald for that question. Recognise his great support and passion for the North Queensland agricultural industry in particular and the great sugar industry around the Burdekin, where uh, Senator Macdonald hails from. And uh, Senator Macdonald is right to highlight the fact that this government understands that for our farming sector to do better, for our farmers to be able to provide for their families and stay on the land, they need to be able to sell their products. They've got to have markets to sell the products to. They've got to have growing markets to get more money to stay competitive and also to make sure they keep, uh, keep the bank happy and the wife happy and the family happy and all those things happy. That's what they need. And so that's why, as a government, uh, over the last six years, we have signed new trade agreements with Japan, with China, with Korea, uh, through the Trade Pacific Partners, Trans Pacific Partnership Agreements, uh, uh, with Indonesia more recently, all massive markets for our farming produce that's helped uh, agricultural producers make more money. Now, I'm going to raise just one particular highlight, one particular individual circumstance as well known to Senator Macdonald, the uh, 2PH farms. Down at Emerald, the Presler family that I know Senator Macdonald, through his career, has helped significantly through different issues, viruses and what have you. But they've also benefited significantly from this government's uh, conclusion of particularly the Chinese free trade agreements, allowed great central Queensland citrus products to go into the growing market of China. It has allowed them to expand. They employ hundreds of people in Emerald, uh, contributing to the, to the central Queensland economy of that area, all thanks to the fact that we're getting more markets open. And that's why in the budget last night, Mr President, we also further announced $30 million to enhance Australia's agricultural trade. This will help farmers uh, overcome some of the non-tariff barriers that exist. So most of the tariff barriers are gone or are being removed, but sometimes it's hard to get products uh, classified, approved through customs in different countries. This funding will help farmers navigate that process, again open up more markets, uh, get more income, provide more jobs in regional communities. Senator Macdonald, supplementary Th question. Thanks, Mr President. I thank the minister for that and thank you for men mentioning TPH, which is a, a great uh, Australian uh, company uh, doing great things in the export uh, area. But, Minister, uh, not all of our farmers just at this moment are doing quite as well because of droughts and uh, floods, particularly in the north and northwest of uh, our state. Uh, so I'm asking the minister uh, how the government is supporting those farmers facing hardships through drought and floods. Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And again, I recognise the, the fact that uh, Senator Macdonald's in some of the areas there that have been impacted the, the, the hardest by droughting, including around Townsville and visited around Guru there a, a few weeks ago saying the impact on the cane fields there, not, not as devastating as what we saw in the Gulf areas with the cattle industry, but still a big impact for those, those farmers. That's why we've, we've announced more than $6 billion of drought funding in the budget last night and over $3 billion in flood uh, relief. That has included the immediate $75,000 grants we provided to farmers impacted from this flood. That's three times the normal level given the significance of this event. Uh, in recent weeks, we've announced that we'll, we'll make up available up to $400,000 in grants 
uh, to, to graziers to restock their land so that we can get these properties, particularly those in the Gulf that have lost thousands of cattle, possibly up to half a million cattle, back on their feet. We provided $5 million to CB CWA, the Country Women's Association, to provide assistance to those uh, in drought, and we're also offering low concessional loans. A lot of other things in the budget to help. We're doing all we can to get people back on their feet Order. after these devastating Senator floods Canada. and droughts. Senator MacDonald, a final supplementary question. Thanks, uh, Mr. President. Uh, and again, I thank the uh, uh, Minister uh, for that and appreciate his advice about how we've helped farmers in uh, need. But uh, we, we're a government, I know, that looks to the future. And I ask the minister uh, how the government is securing the future of our farmers and through them for our nation uh, as a whole. Senator Canavan. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, what we, we have is a positive vision for the future of farming in this country. Right. What we want to see is us grow as a farming country from the 60 odd billion dollars we produce today to 100 billion dollars in recent years to come. We want to feed the, uh, grow the amount of people we feed from about 75 million people that we feed now over double our own population we triple our own population uh, to over 100 million people around the world. And the way you do that Mr President is you build dams. That's you got to build you got to store water. The way you do that Mr President allow people to develop land. Sometimes they have to clear trees to put in new crops that grow food that's good for the world, not just for us, but good for the world. But over there, Mr. President, over there, they don't want any of that. They don't want to build dams. They certainly don't want to let farmers manage their own land, and they are they are insulting our farming communities in this country by adopting green left policies that are going to lock up the land and not let us progress our country to grow more food and develop more more, more local economies in our country. Order, Senator Canavan. Senator Cameron. <coughs> uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Jobs and Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. I refer to the Treasurer, who last night told Australians, and I quote, every one of us want to see wages growing faster, end quote. Can the Minister confirm that in addition to overseeing record low wage growth, the government last night cut forecast wage growth? If so, by how much? The Minister representing the Minister for Jobs and Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, depending on the timing of elections and uh, returns to parliament and uh, outcomes, that may be the last charming and en engrossing question from Senator Cameron we hear <laughs> in this place. And I think it's important to note that for the record, Mr. President, because we've heard lots of charming and engrossing questions from Senator Cameron over time. And it's interesting that he goes to the question of wages growth, Mr. President, because we on this side know one thing about wages growth. The difference between us and them is that you have to have a stronger economy to ensure wages growth. The order. difference. Po order, Senator Payne. Senator Cameron on a point yeah, of order. A, a point of order on relevance. Uh, I simply ask, can the minister confirm? that, uh, in addition to overseeing record low wage growth, the government last night cut forecast wage growth. That's the question. The minister should be drawn to the question. Um, Senator Cameron, you've reminded the minister of the question. She's been speaking for 45 seconds. I'm listening carefully. I call the minister. Thank you very much, Mr President. I think it would be useful to look at actual budget results in the context of Senator Cameron's question, because unlike those opposite, what our budget results have consistently shown is that we have consistently exceeded expectations and that we are delivering a surplus. That would be foreign territory for those opposite, Mr President, unless they have memories that go back to 1989. Uh, notwithstanding that, we of course operate on the basis of using conservative Order. forecasts. Senator, Payne. Senator Wong. Oh, okay. Senator Wong is not raising a point. Said... Senator Payne. We have indeed, Mr. President. Those opposite might not like to hear about it. They might not like to think about it. But we have maintained our path back to surplus on the back of those forecasts and our spending discipline. So. 
We want Australians to earn more and to keep more of what they earn, and that's what we're delivering—a stronger economy, 1.2 million more jobs created by Australian businesses as part of our stronger economy. Wages growth picking up. The Governor of the Reserve Bank, Philip Lowe, has said we are seeing a turning point now evident in the wage price Order. index due Senator to the Payne, stronger time labour market. The answer has expired. Senator Cameron, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. In addition to overseeing record low wage growth and a cut in forecast wage growth, the Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison government has voted eight times to cut the wages of over 700,000 workers relying on penalty rates. How does cutting wages reflect a commitment to higher wages? Senator Payne. So, Mr. President, if you want to look at a risk to the economy, a risk to jobs and a risk to wages, look over there. That is where the risk to the economy, jobs and wages is. Order. What Senator about Labor's Senator Wong on a point of order? Uh, Mr President, really, it's question time and the minister has gone directly to having a go at the opposition, which you know we're used to. We know that's their game plan. But the question is, how does cutting wages reflect a commitment to higher wages? Uh, and, 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 how does cutting wages have a— the minister, well, then answer that question, Senator um, Cormann. Order. Um, the minister was speaking for 11 seconds. I will give the minister a chance to continue a couple more sentences. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. As I was, uh, as I was saying, Mr. President, the strong economy is what will deliver higher wages. Without a strong economy, Mr. President, you cannot deliver higher wages. I understand why this is unfamiliar territory for those opposite, because they don't have the experience in their term in office to have delivered that. And we know, even from the policies that they have uh, exposed so far, that they are promising $200 order. billion dollars in higher taxes. On a point of order. Yeah. On a point yeah, of order, Senator Cameron. Mr. President, this minister hasn't got a clue that what we've asked simply is how does cutting penalty rates relate to higher wages? The minister should be drawn to the question. If she doesn't know, she Senator, should just say she hasn't got a clue. Senator Cameron, I, I, I recorded part of your question as saying how does cutting wages reflect a commitment to higher wages? I believe the minister is being relevant to that part of the question. She is talking about higher wages. Senator, Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll tell you who doesn't have a clue, Mr. President. I'll tell you who doesn't have a clue. Senator Doug Cameron doesn't have a clue. He doesn't have a clue about the impact that $200 billion of higher taxes are going to have on this country and on this economy. He doesn't have a clue about the impact of their big new carbon tax that independent modelling shows will cost over 300,000 jobs. Order, Senator Payne. Senator Cameron, final supplementary question. Maybe we can do better this time. Last month, the Minister for Finance argued that record low wage growth was a deliberate design feature of the Australian economy. Is the coalition government's decision to cut wages and continued failure to do anything to address record low wage growth a part of its deliberate design to leave Australian workers worse off? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, Senator Cameron, consistent to the last, misrepresents government ministers in almost everything that he says, and he's just done it again. What the finance minister has made very clear is that the only way to lift wages is a stronger economy built on more jobs and lower taxes. What Senator Cameron is refusing to acknowledge is those men and women who run small businesses all over Australia who are living in absolute fear of those opposite being elected, destroying their businesses, destroying the economy and destroying their future and that of their children. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank the Senator and ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Pratt. I rise to take note of uh, answers to questions from Senator McAllister, Brown, Giacone Cam and Cameron. And as all of the answers to questions in question time today from this government highlight, what we have before us in this budget 
is a fake budget full of fake, fake promises. Because if you drill down into the answers to every one of the questions that have been answered, asked by the opposition today, you can drive an absolute truck through all of the premises inside the answers to any one of those questions. Now, we have had here, in the answers to questions from Senator McAllister uh, to uh, Minister Fifield, they have completely treated Australians on low incomes as a complete afterthought in this budget. Less than 24 hours after this budget was delivered, we see a backflip for forgotten Australians who weren't included in the $75 payment. Those on Ausstudy, Abstab Study, Double Orphan Pensions, New Start Allowance, Parenting Payments. Why didn't you think of these people before? And if you move from, from that into the other people affected by this budget, look at the fairness. Look at the fairness of the tax cuts contained in this budget, which are inherently biased against those on low incomes. For those under $40,000 getting a puny, tiny tax cut compared to those at the, at, the above, uh, at the top end of town. You see here, if you take someone who's a student on Ofstudy, not only were they going to miss out on their energy supplement, but they have, which has now been um, rectified, but they were also, uh, those on low incomes are absolutely not getting their fair share of the tax cuts in this government. Instead, if you go right out and look at the forward forecasts in these tax cuts, it is an absolute bonanza for high-income earners in our nation. An absolute bonanza. And then, if you look to uh, wage index in our in our nation, as Senator Cameron asked Senator Cash, if you look if you look at the number of uh, the, the false declaration of wages growth in this country that this government has forecast. Not once has this government met forecast wages growth predictions. It was, I think, 3.5 per cent uh, in the 17-18 budget uh, by 2020. The following year, that was pushed out to 2021. And now we see wages growth being pushed out uh, another year. Now, what if, what if those assumptions that the government had put forward about wages growth in our country had been correct? Well, according to the papers that you've put forward, wages should have grown in this country by some 7 per cent. That is despite the fact that you do things like attack penalty rates. What kind of thing is it to expect on one hand that you can deliver wages growth in our nation at the same time as cutting penalty rates? It simply doesn't stack up. You do nothing as a government to stimulate wages growth because your industrial relations settings, and Senator Cormann said it himself, they're pretty much designed to keep wages low in our country. So as we head into uh, this election, which I hope will be called on the weekend, we have before us laid out plain and clear a fake budget full of fake policies. The fundamentals in this budget simply do not add up. The NDIS saving that should have been uh, spent, but it's the slow progress of this com Commonwealth government in dealing with the states, the attacks on penalty rates, uh, the lack of wage rises. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Your time has expired. Yep. I remind senators that uh, the motion passed earlier today that the exact cutoff for this debate will be 3:30. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The budget is back in black and Australia is back on track. 
Are there 12 more beautiful words in the English language than those? If there are, I haven't heard them. I am so proud to be speaking this afternoon on Treasurer Josh Frydenberg's first and outstanding budget, the first of many Frydenberg budgets, I hope. It's a remarkable budget because it does return the budget to surplus, and it does so without increasing taxes and while guaranteeing essential services. In fact, not only have we returned the budget to surplus without increasing taxes, we're returning the budget to surplus while cutting taxes, delivering hard-working Australians the, the tax relief that they need and deserve. In fact, cumulatively, between this budget and the last one, we're reducing personal income taxes by almost $300 billion. That makes the choice at this election very clear between the opposition, led by Mr Shorten, and the government, led by Mr Morrison, and the clearly contrasting tax plans that we're taking to this election. From the coalition, you have $300 billion of lower personal income taxes. And from the Labor Party, you have $200 billion of increased taxes at least. That's a $500 billion turnaround for hardworking Australians in terms of the tax burden they will bear, depending on who wins this upcoming election. In this financial year alone, up to 10 million working Australians will receive tax cuts of up to $1,080 in this financial year. By the time our tax plan is rolled out in full, 94 per cent of taxpayers will face a marginal rate of no greater than 30 per cent. This effectively eliminates the scourge of bracket creep for all workers earning between $45,000 and $200,000. They'll face no disincentive in the form of higher taxes to taking more risks, to taking on more hours and to being more productive and entrepreneurial. We're of course not just delivering a surplus, but we're putting the federal government finally on a path to paying back the debt burden that was left to us. We've taken six years to get back to surplus, despite the best efforts of those opposite to make it even harder and longer, and we're forecasting that within 10 years all of the net debt accrued as a result of the irresponsible fiscal path that we were placed upon as a country by the Labor Party will be reversed. The damage will be undone. Net debt will reach zero by 2029-30. In time, this will help alleviate the $18 billion of interest payments that Australian taxpayers currently have to meet every year. $18 billion of interest payments a year makes that uh, item one of the single biggest budget items that we have to service. And that is in a time of record low interest rates. God forbid if we weren't able to put us on a path to fiscal repair if interest rates ever return to higher and more normal levels. This, of course, is despite the best efforts of the Labor Party, particularly in this chamber, to thwart our efforts to repair the budget and make that task as difficult as possible. Importantly, we've done all of this. Return the budget to surplus had meaningful tax relief for working Australians. We've done all of this while guaranteeing the essential services that Australian people rely on. This government will deliver record funding for health. It will deliver record funding for education. It will deliver record investment in our national defence. We've done all this without raising taxes. We haven't had to have a hit on self-funded retirees. We haven't had to have a hit on property investors. We haven't had to have a hit on small and medium business owners. We've had no hit on income taxpayers and we've had no hit uh, on those who use family trusts. All of those people who will be in the gun if Mr Shorten and the Labor Party are successful at the upcoming election. How do we do this? By restraining the growth of spending with prudent fiscal management, led particularly by our Finance Minister, Mayor Tears Cormann, and presiding over a growing economy that's delivered 1.3 million jobs. The choice could not be clearer. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Senator Stirl. Yeah, thank you, Madam Deputy President. 
Now, I was sitting there early on in your chair, Madam Deputy President, earlier on when I heard Senator uh, Macdonald talk about the standards in this chamber, how it slipped over the last 28 years, the 29 years he'd been here. And I can say over the last 14 years I've been here. You know, the nastiness, it, it's just incredible. And uh, I sit myself and I saw it from the time that uh, Mr Abbott took over the leadership, standards really did drop. And I don't think I get much of an argument from most of us that aren't Liberal senators. Um, but also, Senator Macdonald said about the lies that are perpetrated in this chamber and other chambers and get away with it. But there's a greater lie here. We are not back in black. We're not. There's still debt. And it won't be back in black projected till next year. So there's another blatant lie that's being peddled by the government. But we understand that their backbench senators get wheeled out and have to run the company line or the party line. So there's a classic example. But that's, I'm not blaming Senator Patterson because that's what the Treasurer is saying, that's what the Prime Minister is saying. I just want to quote one page of an article that was, uh, came to my attention, and it was by Greg, or it is by Greg Jerigay. Uh, Jericho from The Guardian, and he says uh, it's under the heading The Seven Graphs That Exposed the Coalition's 2019 Budget Fairy Tale. And I won't go too much into it, but he does say tax cuts, surpluses, and fancifully optimistic forecasts add to, up to a make believe budget. And he says Morrison, I'm quoting, in splashes the cash in final election sell to the suburbs. The rosy forecast in Frydenberg's budget, I'm quoting him. I, if it was me saying it, I'd refer to their proper titles and the big assumptions beyond them. And I'll just round it off on this, where he also goes to say this year's budget is an odd mix of tax cuts and spending measures targeted to win an election, but with, it, with assumptions so joyous and optimistic that you could be forgiven for thinking the Liberal Party wants to lose just so it can blame the ALP for not living up to their predictions. I mean. People are awake up to this. The media are awake up to this. But this has been a real strange session. Now, I'm not using these as props, Madam Deputy President. I just want to put them under my nose so I can refer to them. But it was brought to my attention by Senator Gallagher this morning, and I hadn't noticed. But this is the first time in living memory, well, certainly from me and others, and I'd be interested to hear from other senators, and especially, especially yourself, Madam Deputy President. Normally, when we have the papers after the budget, there's the there is the, the, the photoshop of the uh, treasurer looking as a leader. There is always, you know how the cameramen get down and they make the treasurer look like they're, you know, they're, the, they're huge and this is a thumping win for our nation. What, have, what, are the, what do Australia's papers carry today? Can you believe just about every paper in this nation, I'll hold it down here so I don't get told off, okay. It's cartoons. So on that the Australian, which I call the paper they give away for free at the airport. There is the um, uh, treasurer, Mr Frydenberg, and he's got no clothes on, sitting on a cloud. He's the love cherub, you know, with the bow and arrow, and he's got he's smiling and big rosy red cheeks, and he's shooting arrows out there, and there's money being aimed at nurses and uh, construction workers, I would assume, with the helmet on. But in the background, Big black clouds, ominous black clouds, with life taking lightning flying out of that black cloud. Then we go to the Fin Review, the last one, one of the last organs you think would turn the budget into a cartoon. But here they have uh, Mr. Frydenbird on the back of a truck, and it's got back in black, back in black. He's playing a guitar. There's the Prime Minister drawn in the cartoon. He's playing a flute or something, and they're mimicking the ACDC, you know, long way to the top down Swanson Street. Uh, but there's a big road sign saying, virtually look out, there's holes in front roadworks. There you go. This is how they're seriously they're taking it. Here's the front page of the Daily Telegraph. We've got the, the I was going to say the Corminator. We've got the Terminator there puffing on a cigar and others, and uh, they're taking the mickey about uh, um, um, prime cuts and they're cooking a barbecue. Then we have this one here, the Canberra Times. They have Mr Frydenberg dressed up as a, you know, those ukulele, what do you call those things in the mountains, you know? But it's, uh, and he's got funny pants on with money falling out of them. And then he's got the Prime Minister sitting on a bull there as the election rodeo. I'm not making this up. Wait till we get to this one, the Herald Sun. Oh, my goodness, man. I'm not allowed to use it as a prop, and I wouldn't dare. But anyway, here's a picture of an overweight Prime Minister with a pair of shorts on the footy jumper kicking the ball and showing hairy legs. It just keeps getting worse. Then you have this one here, the West Australian, where they've got the Mr Frydenberg as some genie rubbing a bottle. I'm not showing you. Hoping for wishes. You get 30 wishes, not three. It's an absolute joke. They're all wake up to you. 
Oh, thank you, Senator Still. Your time has expired. Senator Macdonald. Well, uh, can only thank Senator, <laughs> the Senator for uh, his commentary about cartoons and newspapers. It shows how much the Labor Party have got to attack on the, uh, the wonderful budget. But look, uh, Madam Deputy President, tomorrow night you're going to hear a, uh, you're going to be subjected to uh, what will be called an alternative budget by the alternative government. It will be full of lies, mistruths and misconstruction. Let me just t warn anyone who might be listening to Mr Shorten tomorrow night about Labor's record on what they promise and what they do. Remember, there will be no carbon tax under a government I lead. A Labor leader said that, was elected and the first bit of legislation that came in was a carbon tax. Mr Swan, for the six years that I heard him deliver budgets in this chamber, each year promised that next year there would be a surplus in the budget, and not once was there a surplus. In fact, in most years the deficit went up. And if you want to listen to what Labor promises, just go back to the 93 election, where Labor promised tax cuts. In fact, they did more than promise tax cuts. They actually passed a law, and it was called the LAW Law Tax Cuts. They were legislated. Labor did that because they thought they were going to lose the 93 election. Turned out, miraculously, they won that election. You know the first thing they did when they came back into office? They reneged on it. They cancelled. They cancelled that LAW Law Tax Cuts. So whatever you hear Mr Shorten say tomorrow night, just know that it won't be truthful, it'll be misconstrued, and don't take my word for it. Go back and look at the record of right Labor's uh, uh, budget uh, misfeasance. Uh, just a couple of things need to be raised, uh, Madam Deputy President. Uh, uh, the first that Labor senator uh, kept talking about penalty rates being uh, dropped by this government. Uh, a lot of Labor senators keep talking about that. A complete and abject outright lie. They know that penalty rate uh, decisions were made by the Fair Work Commission. And who set up the Fair Work Commission? The Labor Party and government. Who appointed most of the judges to the Fair Work Commission? The Labor Party. And yet they continue the lie that it's the government that's cut penalty rates. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, Ms. Madam uh, uh, Deputy President, Labor simply can't be trusted with money. This is a wonderful budget. Every low to middle income earner will get $1,000 more in their pay packet uh, once the uh, government's laws are brought in. For a dual income family, uh, that's uh, $2,160 to help uh, low income earners, middle income earners support consumption growth and ease the cost of living. As my colleague uh, Cinder Patterson has uh, explained, uh, there are tax cuts for all uh, going into the future. And immediately, immediately for small business, the engine room of Australia's economy, uh, there is uh, the instant tax write-off increased from 25 to 30,000. And uh, it seems, if I'm reading the budget right, that that now becomes a permanent feature for small business. Uh, and why can we give away? Why can we make these concessions to small business? Why can we make these? Uh, uh, concessions to low and middle income earners. Why can we have record spending on education, record spending on health, more drugs, more expensive drugs put on the PBS? Why can we substantially increase infrastructure expenditure to $100 billion over the next 10 years? Why can we do all this? Because we've managed the economy carefully. We've got the budget back into the black. We've got the uh, budget in the way that in the forward years there will be more surpluses and we'll be able to build more hospitals, more schools, uh, more roads, because that's what you can do when you carefully manage the uh, finances and uh, carefully uh, manage uh, government uh, expenditure. Labor, on the other hand, will spend like crazy. We know that. Everybody knows that. Uh, they'll buy votes with it. But someone always has to pay, and we've seen the results of that. 
uh, we've seen the job that our governments had to do to get the budget back in black and keep it going that way. We need to do that because we need that money to spend Thank on you, essential Senator services. McDonald, your time has expired. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I rise to take notice, a note of the uh, questions uh, asked of a number of government senators in relation to last night's federal budget. And as my colleagues have already said, uh, there's really only one way you can describe last night's federal budget, and that is a massive election con job. This budget last night comes after six years of neglect of the Australian people, and worse still than neglect, outright cuts to the services that so many Australians depend upon right across my state of Queensland and right across this country. Over the last six years, we have seen cut after cut from this LNP government to schools across Queensland, to hospitals across Queensland, uh, to infrastructure uh, that Queensland desperately needs as a growing state. Uh, and on top of all of those cuts, the other thing that has defined this government over the last six years is absolute chaos. Uh, from year to year, from Prime Minister to Prime Minister, the knives have been out constantly. Uh, the undermining has happened uh, constantly as well. And I was just thinking before, we've, we're now on our third Prime Minister uh, under this government, and if they try really hard, they've still got a few hours left to knife another Prime Minister and put in a fourth. That's the kind of thing that you couldn't rule out from this government. Such is the level of chaos that we have seen from them over the last six years. So six years of cuts and chaos delivered by this government, and they're trying to paper over it now with a new Prime Minister and a new Treasurer and a new federal budget. Um, but I, I have confidence that the Australian people will see through this and that Queenslanders back in my home state will see through this and will see that this is just an election con job, that a government that's on the ropes, that has neglected them for six years, is trying to rush through in a belated attempt to win them over. As I was watching last night's budget, I was actually thinking it reminded me quite a lot of sending someone a, bel a belated birthday card six years after their birthday. So for six years, this government has cut back on service to Queensland, neglected what Queenslanders need, and six years later, on the eve of an election, they, they come out and say, well, here's a few sweeteners, we'll try and win you over. The problem this government has is that, in my experience, when you send someone a belated birthday card, all they remember is the fact that you forgot their birthday in the first place. And I'm very confident that last night's budget will show uh, that Queenslanders and Australians in general will not forget uh, the fact that this government has cut their services, will not forget the fact that wages have barely grown under this government. They'll remember all of those things, just like they'd remember it if it was a birthday that this government had forgotten and sent them a belated birthday card six years down the track. I was also remembering before, you know, we're all being a little bit reminiscing because this is probably the last session of part, last, last day of sittings before the next election. And who could forget one of the LNP shining stars in Queensland over many years, but the former Senator George Brandis. And some of you might remember that he had some things to say about the Queensland LNP uh, before the last state election, and he described them as being very, very mediocre. Well, I think that description could also be applied to last night's federal budget delivered by this government. Very, very mediocre. And it was particularly mediocre for my home state of Queensland. This budget last night, all it did, rather than put money back into the services that Queenslanders, Queenslanders need, it actually locked in the hundreds of millions of dollars of cuts that we've seen to Queensland hospitals, the hundreds of millions of dollars of cuts that we've seen to Queensland schools, to TAFEs, to apprenticeships. We had in question time today ministers getting up and talking about all this great news about new funding for skills. Well, why didn't you do some of it sometime over the last six years rather than pulling it out of the bottom drawer just before an election? Mackay, in one of Queensland's most, reg most uh, important regional towns, is now suffering from a skill shortage, with unemployment down to about 3 per cent and employers struggling to find people for jobs. And why would that be? Could that be something to do with the fact that this government has cut tens of thousands of apprenticeships over the last six years? And all of a sudden they want us to forget about that and, and look at the fact that they're putting in a few little trickles of money for apprenticeships and for skills into the future. So this budget last night locked in those cuts to schools, to hospitals, to TAFEs, didn't reverse them at all. The budget has no plan to lift the wages of Queensland working people who have barely had pay rises for any of the six years that this government has been in power. And probably worst of all is that there, there is not a single dollar 
of funding from the federal government for new infrastructure in Queensland, not just this year, but next year as well. So they want us to look at all these infrastructure projects they're talking about, but they're years into the distance. Not only would you need to vote for this government at the coming election, but you'd need to vote for them at the next one as well. It is a joke. It is a Thank con you, job. Senator and Queenslanders will see through it. Expired. The question is that the motion is moved by Senator Pratt to take note of answers to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe it's carried. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move to take note of the response from the Leader of Government Business in the Senate to the question asked by Senator Di Natale during question time. Well, another budget, another year of the coalition selling out our future. Billions of dollars in subsidies to help burn fossil fuels, money to help unlock new gas, a bill being rammed through later on this evening, with Labor's help, I might add, to enable taxpayer money to push more fossil fuel projects overseas. In fact, this budget contains more money to reopen the Christmas Island Detention Centre so the Prime Minister could hold the most expensive press conference in our country's history than it does new money to respond to the emergency of climate change. Our temperature records are tumbling. The hottest three months ever recorded, smashing the previous record by a degree. We are running at over two degrees Celsius above the long-term trend. In recent times, apocalyptic scenes have dominated our news. In my state of Tasmania, communities have been threatened and our precious, unique wilderness World Heritage Area devastated by fires made more likely and more dangerous by the breakdown of our climate. Vast areas of Queensland have flooded. Thank you, and we've Senator seen... McKim. Your time has expired. I'm sorry, that's the second time in two days I've cut you off uh, because uh, I did remind senators that we passed the motion earlier in the day to do a sharp cut off at 3.30. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, the ayes have it.